Amen. God has ordained praise through the mouths of babes. What a blessing. Please stand in honor of God's word and join in turning me to Ephesians chapter 4. Brother Ethan will be preaching from Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes, But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Good morning, everybody. Now let's pray. Father God, uh, we come before you today and we seek your blessing, Lord. As we look ahead, we stand on the precipice of a new year. Lord, help us to see in the past, in this last year, uh, where maybe we've fallen short, where maybe we've missed the mark, Lord. By your Spirit, would you work in us and help us in looking ahead now to draw closer to you, to do just what your text commands of us today, to lay aside the old self, to put on the new. But Lord, we know that we can't do that on our own, that we rely on you to work a miraculous work, a renewal in our mind. Uh, Lord, be with me now as I preach and give me grace where I'm weak and give grace to the hearers today that they would hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> it's New Year's Eve once again. And that means tonight at midnight, the same way it's happened for centuries, we turn the final page on our calendars. We say goodbye to 2023 and we start anew. Time as we know it marches on. And so long as the Lord continues to show us mercy and to tarry, there's something about the new year that incites a sense of refreshing, renewed vigor for people all around the world. It's a fresh start, an opportunity to start again or to correct course, perhaps to try something new. Every year, millions of people around the globe set their mind to the task of creating for themselves a New Year's resolution. Have we all set a New Year's resolution for 2024 yet? Perhaps, maybe not. By the end of the message, I hope that you'll reconsider your New Year's resolution. <clears throat> Interestingly, this is not a new idea. And the New Year's resolution can be traced back as far as the ancient Macedonians, around 4000 BC, according to one history.com article. I did search the internet, I didn't search very hard. During a massive 12-day religious festival known as Akitu, the Babylonians crowned a new king or reaffirmed their loyalty to the reigning king. They also made promises to the gods to pay their debts to return any objects they'd borrowed. This tradition can be traced through the centuries, often having religious roots, driven by the desire to appease some greater power to receive blessing over one's life. The New Year's resolution has become a much more secular convention in our day and age, primarily focused on self-improvement and self-fulfillment. According to a survey conducted by Forbes Health, the top resolutions for 2024 pertain to improved fitness, improved finances, improved mental health, weight loss, and improved diet. All worthy of resolution. All worthy of resolution. Of course, we've heard the other statistics as well. <clears throat> 
the amazing jump in gym membership at the beginning of the year. And then by quarter two, we're back to normal. Yeah? We find oftentimes that while we resolve to do a great number of things to bring about change in our life, our pragmatic approach leaves us powerless to effect true change within ourselves. Change can be exceptionally difficult, and while pragmatic solutions may work for a little while, true change is a matter of the heart and of the mind. My message this morning is not about self-help. I'm not here to offer practical advice on weight loss or fitness or improved mental health or financial wellness. You'd be wise not to buy any of that from me. (laughs) Instead, my aim this morning is to show you that God has established in his son, Jesus Christ, an example for us to follow. And he's established in the gospel freedom from slavery to sin in our former way of life. He's replaced hard, stony, ignorant hearts with hearts that are fleshy and receptive to the truth of the gospel. It brings to mind the second half of a favorite poem of mine by John Bunyan. It says, run, John, run. Here's the whole poem. Run, John, run, the law demands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings, because it bids us fly and gives us wings. You see, the gospel bids us fly, but it, in this heart change, has given us wings as well, so to speak. The passage this morning is set in a letter that for centuries has helped the body of Christ to find its identity and its purpose, the book of Ephesians. So if you will turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4, verse 20, we will start looking through the text. My first point this morning, learn Jesus, the source of truth. So look at the beginning of verse 20, where Paul is preparing now to exhort the Ephesian believers and all saints throughout history to live the Christian life. He says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. And so obviously I've dropped us into the middle of an argument, in the middle of Paul's thought. So I've got some work to do to bring you all up to speed. His aim is to remind them of the way they learned Christ, Christ being the sum of their learning. And he has set up a contrast here between the right way and the wrong way to do so in order to emphasize his teaching. So let's take a moment and look at some of the immediate context for our passage in the surrounding verses. Paul spent the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians laying out strong core doctrine about who Jesus is and what he's accomplished in these believers. He now turns in chapters 4 through 6 to application, where he is essentially saying, in light of all this doctrine that I've just taught you or reminded you of, do this, live in this way. When he says, but you did not learn Christ in this way, he's alluding to a description of the Gentiles from verses 17 through 19 in chapter 4. So if you'll follow along with me there, where we can get a glimpse of how not to walk if we have learned Christ properly. Verse 17, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. Remember, he's writing to a gathering of believers in Ephesus who are primarily Gentile in background. The phrase, walk no longer, clearly implies that these believers once did walk this way, which he's already acknowledged in chapter 2 of this book, but we'll get there in a minute. So Paul's affirming with the Lord a command not to walk as the Gentiles walk, and now he will describe three ways that they walk that are contrary to God. Very helpful in order for us to avoid this way of thinking, this lifestyle. The first way of walking is in the futility of their mind. This calls to mind Paul's descriptions elsewhere in the Bible of non-believers who think themselves wise by their own approximation. The first passage that comes to my mind is Romans 1, which shares in much of the language that Paul's using here in verses 17 through 19 of Ephesians. The word here for futility suggests being void of useful aim or goal. Void of useful aim or goal. Isn't that exactly what we see in our old self? and in non-believers even today, thinking that is void of useful aim or goal. The Gentile, the non-believer, has disacknowledged God's existence and his sovereign rule over creation. They've removed God from his rightful place on his throne in heaven and have inserted blank. You name it. They worship it. People worship carved idols due to feudal thinking. <laughs> 
While this is not as prevalent in our day-to-day life here in the States, it's still happening all over the world. People worship false religious systems due to feudal thinking, perhaps even thinking that they worship the same God that we do, the one true God, but in ways that are not prescribed by his word. People worship human logic and knowledge due to feudal thinking. Darwin's theory of evolution, if you boil down all the controversy, is nothing more than another false system of belief. A scientific worldview, nothing more than misplaced faith in the feudal thinking of man. The second way the Gentiles walk is, starting in verse 18 there, being darkened in their understanding. Cross-referencing again to Romans 1, you might say that they've fallen prey to futile speculation and their foolish hearts have been darkened. It's the language that he uses in Romans 1. Their foolish hearts have been darkened. So then a darkened heart naturally gives way to darkened understanding. They're also, here's the third way, that they walk excluded from the life of God. They walk excluded from the life of God. And Paul explains this statement a little further here with the reason for their exclusion from the life of God, which is because of the ignorance that is in them, The ignorance within them is ultimately to blame for their exclusion from the life of God. Paul takes it another step further and explains the reason for this ignorance because of the hardness of their heart. Hard-heartedness giving way to ignorance, which excludes them from the life of God. The hardened heart is not like the one that I described earlier, the fleshy heart that's receptive to the delightful things of God. Instead, it is described here as callous giving way to sensuality and impurity with greediness, verse 19. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Paul, back in Romans 1, describes this as an act of God, the giving over, essentially making the case that he gave them what they themselves had already given themselves over to. They received in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is the way that Paul says you have not learned Christ, not in futile thinking, not darkened in your understanding, and certainly not excluded from the life of God because of hard-hearted ignorance that gives way to greedy sensuality. Instead, we look to the very beginning of Ephesians 4 and see that Paul is appealing to the believer to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility, in gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He describes the Christian life here as a walk. I've already used the terminology several times this morning. This is surely where we get that phrase from. He's expertly laid before his reader and by extension before all of us two different ways that we might walk in this life. There's the way of the Christian, a worthy walk in humility and gentleness, patience, tolerance for one another in love and diligence to preserve our unity. Remember, he's speaking to a church full of Gentile believers, just like you and I, a church full of Gentile believers. And there's the way that the Gentiles walk, futile in mind, darkened in understanding, excluded from the life of God. These two walks are both mutually exclusive. He's not saying that you can walk both of these walks simultaneously. He's calling us away from the old walk and fully into the new. Yes, sin remains with us, but we must set our sights on the prize and make no provision for the flesh. Sometimes I worry we are too quick to excuse carnal behavior because of the sin that remains within us. We're resigned in our battle because it feels insurmountable. We must remember that we've been set free from sin's shackles. It is no longer our master. This is Romans 6, 6 through 7. You guys might like to put a finger in Romans because I'm going to be going back and forth between there and here. Romans 6, 6 through 7. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. In order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin we're going to talk more in a few minutes about our old self 
Paul's going to call for the Ephesian believers to lay their old self aside. He says here that our old self was crucified with him, but why? In order that our body of sin might be done away with. Therefore, we should think of ourselves as dead to and free from sin. Praise be to God and Jesus who has set us free from sin. While sin remains, it's no longer master of us. Jesus is. He, having become a man himself, bears with our weaknesses. He knows our condition well, and now he is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, where he daily intercedes for us. All of this is of grace, a free gift of God to those who believe. Let us labor then not to squander that gift in licentiousness or in legalism, and to see ourselves as we truly are, dead to sin and alive to God. Okay, we're back in Ephesians 4. Let's look at verse 21. Paul's going to set a condition for those who did not learn Christ in this way, the way the Gentiles walk. He says, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. John 10.27 further explains this hearing that Paul is referring to. Hear the words of Jesus in this passage. He's addressing a crowd of unbelieving Jews who were hostile against him. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Paul says, If you have heard his voice, if you remember his teachings and were taught in him, you will walk not like the Gentiles walk, but instead in a manner worthy of the calling of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says it's something like, unless you believed in vain. Unless you believed in vain. You get a sense that maybe some among the Ephesians heard the message with ears that could not hear or saw with eyes that could not see. Paul is pointing to the way they are conducting themselves in the church to shake them from their old way of thinking and living. He's already very clearly laid out the work of Christ before them in this letter. He's assuredly shown them by his own example what Christ-like living looks like. They've been established in the truth, and now they need to continuously walk in that same truth. The truth Paul is guiding them toward is summed up in Jesus, who is himself, according to John 14, 6, the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Those are the words of Jesus. So Jesus himself being the source of all truth, everything we know about God can be summed up and realized in him. Paul in verse 20 and 21 in Ephesians has reminded us of this marvelous truth and directed us to fix our eyes on Christ and to learn him well. We've seen what it looks like to learn Christ the wrong way. We've looked back at some of Paul's spirit-directed guidance on what it looks like when we've learned Christ the right way. Paul's now going to describe the way we participate with God in our miraculous transformation. We realized earlier the difficulties of pragmatic change in our lives. Paul is going to describe what God-empowered change looks like. This is a change that leads from death to life, from darkness to light, and from old to new. And so my second point for the message, lay aside the old self. Here's verse 22 that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. So let's look at that first phrase for a moment. He says, that in reference to your former manner of life. Paul has already described this former manner of life. We briefly touched on the way the Gentiles walk in our first point, uh, looking at verses 17 through 19, that they conduct themselves in futility of mind and in darkened understanding excluded from the life of God, but he describes our former state much more vividly at the beginning of chapter 2. So if you turn back a page or two to chapter 2 in Ephesians, and we'll start at verse 1. I'm going to read a few verses, but I'm going to comment as I go, so don't get too excited. Starting at verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. In our former estate... Before we were in Christ, we were dead. Alive, perhaps, on two feet, walking around, living a life, 
But it says here we were dead in our trespasses and sins. These trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Make no mistake, we have an enemy at work in the world who seeks to devour us. He's described here as the prince of the power of the air and the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. And there was a time in our lives before we came to know Christ that we walked under the dominion of this prince. All glory to God for sending us the prince of peace, the king of kings and lord of lords. But let us never forget that among them we too, this is verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This is the former manner of life that Paul's referring to. Notice he includes himself in this class of people with a first-person plural pronoun, we, we all formerly lived. In our former manner of life, we were dead to the things of God. As children of wrath, we were mortal enemies of God. Sin was the benchmark before, and it was all we knew. Being dead to the things of God means that we were also hopeless to deliver ourselves from the spiritual deadness by our own devices. Someone dead to the things of God is powerless to choose good. It's powerless ultimately to change, and we need a Savior to intervene. We need divine intervention. Here's what I went with. We need a divine conjunction, but God. A divine conjunction. But God, in verse 4, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Look at all the things God is doing here. Made us alive. He raised us up. He seated us with him. He's showing kindness toward us in Christ. It's on the basis of this work that God has done in us that we do anything to participate in the transformation that Paul is describing for us in chapter 4. God is rich in mercy and love toward us, having acted upon us even when we were completely dead to him spiritually, even though we were his mortal enemies up to that point in our lives. Romans 5, 8 says, God commends his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took dead people and made them alive. Who but God can take dry bones and by his spirit breathe life back into them? He raised us up with him, that is Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We now, in Christ, have access to our creator. We've been reconciled to him. The enmity between us has been satisfied in Christ. We were once children of wrath. We have now been adopted as sons and daughters, children of God. Verse 8 there in Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God's work in us leaves no room for boasting in ourselves of the great and pious deeds we've done to somehow earn any of it. How can a dead man or a dead woman do anything? How could a mortal enemy of God take credit for any of this? It's all entirely of God, and that's reason to celebrate him and to glorify him. Amen. So you see then that short of a miracle of God, we are all powerless to turn to him for our salvation. He, having worked this miracle in us now, having set us free from bondage to sin, will direct us to act, to do the good works which he prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, the same good works that he created us to do in Christ Jesus. Now we've examined this former manner of life that Paul is referring to, and we've seen the great miraculous work that God did in making us alive to himself taking us from a state of deadness to spiritual things and a state of slavery to sin and making us alive 
to spiritual things and free from the bondage to our trespasses and sins. Now we have a firm foundation to stand on when God, through Paul, directs us to do anything in terms of aligning ourselves with Christ, to walk in a manner worthy of God. Now we're back in chapter 4 again, in the middle of verse 22. He says, lay aside the old self, you lay aside the old self. In what sense does Paul mean for us to lay aside this old self? This term lay aside is interesting. I'm not much different from any of you when it comes to the original languages. I know just enough to be dangerous or to get myself into trouble. That's all I know. But I think it's important in whatever way we are able, we try to interact with the original languages as often as we can because sometimes there are things that make the text worlds clearer for us than the English does all by itself. The Greek term here is apothesthai, and the English translators did well to render it lay aside. It calls to mind the idea of taking off and laying aside a garment. Paul's encouraging his readers to think of the old self as a dirty garment that you might pull over your head and cast into the laundry hamper. What's just as interesting about this Greek term is that it is in the middle voice. I don't know much about morphology. I'm with you guys. I'll try and explain it in a way that's easier to understand. It's helped shed some light on the meaning of this passage for me. I'll assume you're all like me and you're not English experts or Greek experts. For a long time in my walk with Christ, if I may be candid, I misunderstood the nature of sanctification. That is the ongoing process of being made holy by God or being consecrated to God. The process that eventually leads us to greater and greater Christ-likeness throughout our lives. And then eventually, either when Christ returns or when we depart from this earthly tent and final judgment to future glory with him in heaven. I misunderstood that I assumed that his work of sanctification was passive. It's something that he was constantly doing in me. I didn't see it as something that I did myself. Now, I'm not saying he isn't doing something in me that I could not do myself, because he is, but the means by which he brings that work about in me is actually quite active on my part. That the term lay aside here is in the middle voice means that the subject of the sentence, that is you or me, is acting upon itself. This isn't just some supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Though as I've already said, I'd be helpless to act in this way without his already working in me, but it's my job now to do the laying aside. Here's another fun lexical word for you, and I'm probably taking this way too far. It's not past tense, it's not present tense, it's not future tense, it's in the aorus tense, which means that Paul is describing it here as a snapshot event. He's not describing it as an ongoing process, continually laying aside He's saying, do it. Lay aside the old self once and for all. Remember in Romans 6, he's already described the old self as crucified, dead. Lay it aside. Paul describes this God-empowered change that requires our our participation elsewhere too. Here are some examples. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, But now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We prickle a little when we read that statement. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We know that Paul certainly doesn't mean that we somehow earn our salvation. Certainly not. What he means is that our salvation, which will naturally produce works, works that confirm our faith, according to James, requires diligent labor on our part. So we work out our salvation, but all glory and boasting goes to God because we wouldn't be able to do it. We wouldn't even want to do it if it weren't for God working in us. God is at work, it says, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So he supplies both the doing and the wanting to do in our worthy walk. See, what I'm trying to show you There's tension. There's tension here. It's not all the work of the Spirit like I once falsely thought, nor is it all the work of man. Instead, it is our participation with Christ in us and the Holy Spirit of God that brings true and lasting transformation. 
We could never do it ourselves. We could never even want to do it ourselves. But God is the driving force behind all of our Christian work. Here's one more example from Romans 8. So then, brethren, we are under obligation. This is verses 12 through 13, I'm sorry. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You and I here in this passage are the ones who are putting to death the deeds of the body. But we are described as putting these deeds to death by the Spirit. So it seems this is a matter of life and death. Living according to the flesh requires that you die, but there is great hope here too. He says, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. I wonder, can you and I look back on our Christian walk since we came to Christ and see evidence of this work? Can you see over the weeks and months and years a steady decline in sin? Maybe it started with big glaring issues. You kicked a drinking problem. You kicked a porn problem. You stopped using vile language. Maybe you've started to identify some of the more subtle sins in your life. Fear of man that's driving you to compromise for the sake of pleasing people. Pride that makes you arrogant or pride that makes you falsely humble. Do you realize that this is all the work of the Holy Spirit in you? That by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body and that you will live as a result? This is profound evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life by which you can be assured that God's salvation has come to you. Maybe you're stuck. Maybe you're engaged in battle right now with besetting sin. Be calling you today to lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and to put on the new self. You are not powerless in your effort to do so, because it is God who supplies everything you need to change and to turn to Him. Come back with me to Ephesians 4, verse 22. We're looking at the latter portion of verse 22, where we get a glimpse of the forever state of the old self. He says, Lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And so the old self is doomed to corruption in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Pay attention to the personification of deceit here, as it will be said against its mortal enemy in the coming verses, truth. These lusts of deceit are just that because they promise something that they cannot deliver. Our depraved flesh craves these things, but these things are steadily, degree by degree, corrupting the old self. They eventually lead to death. So thus far we've seen that there's a wrong way to walk the Christian walk and a right way. Paul is confident that these Ephesians have been well instructed, that they have learned Jesus well, so to speak. And so my first call to you this morning was to learn Jesus, who is the source of truth, the sum of all Christian teaching. Paul's exhortation and encouragement to them is to walk worthy of God, and he appeals to the power of God that is at work in them, having supplied everything they need to walk that walk. With all of this in mind, we're called then to lay aside the old self, to pull it off of ourselves like a dirty garment. This transformational work God has done in us doesn't merely strip away the old self and its corrupt, deceitful desires. He instead makes us new. He's replacing this old self. Calling us to renewal in the spirit of our minds, calling us to put on this new self in place of the old. So let's discover just what this new self is really like. Here's a third point for my message. It's put on the new self. Put on the new self. Uh, let's pick up at the front of verse 23 where Paul is going to continue his exhortation to these learned Ephesian saints. He says, And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So first things first, he calls us to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. It seems that this transformation is not merely a matter of our taking off and putting on, but there is an element here of passivity, an aspect that is outside of the scope of our own abilities. The renewal of the mind is not something that I do. It's something that God has done in me, more specifically in the spirit of my mind. But what does that even mean? Let's look at a couple of similar passages and see if we can glean any further insight as to this renewing of the mind. Romans 12, verse 2 it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12 serves the same purpose as Ephesians 4 in, in their respective letters. It functions as Paul's transition from doctrinal teaching to real-life application of the doctrine. So he's spent in Romans 11 chapters of doctrine, teaching concerning Christ and the nature of true righteousness. And then right here at the beginning of his application, just like in Ephesians, is a call to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But he contrasts this transformation with conformity to this world. This renewing of the mind is contrasted with conformity to the world. So it would seem that the renewing of the mind that he has in mind here is conformity to something else, perhaps something not of this world, something that is good and acceptable and perfect. Renewing of your mind means conformity to the will of God, which leads ultimately to transformation here and in Ephesians to the laying aside of the old self and the putting on of the new. Here's another passage that's going to sound strikingly familiar. Colossians 3, 8 through 10. It says, But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. It should come as no surprise that we see such strikingly similar language between these two letters. They were written very near to the same time, may even have been delivered to their respective churches near the same time. Paul's reference to renewal and the miraculous transformation of the believer is a renewal to a true knowledge. This true knowledge naturally contrasts then with a the knowledge that we've already discussed, the knowledge that the Gentiles revere knowledge that is bred in the futility of their minds, knowledge that springs from a darkened understanding, and knowledge that leaves them excluded from the life of God. Instead, Christians are renewed in their minds from futile thinking and are able to grasp the things of God. Now, I have a beloved family member, and I'm sure you all have family members like this as well. He just doesn't really get the tech-centric nature of our generation. He was around well before computers became a household item, and he just never really cared to learn the ins and outs. I'll admit, sometimes I wish they weren't such an important part of our lives, but I'm resigned to keep up, because in a lot of ways, there's good that comes with the bad. Well, this beloved family member expressed to me the other day an interest in learning a new language. And so the first thing that came to my mind, and there's several of you in this room that are actively using Duolingo to learn a new language, an application on your phone. Uh, imagine my surprise then when I took his phone and attempted to download the app for him that I was not able to do so. He's never installed a single update <laughs> on his phone since he took it home. He can't download applications onto his phone because he's running an operating system that's not compatible with the app. I actually attempted to do the update for him, but he's so far behind that the only way to get back up to date is to plug his phone into a computer. <laughs> I think the depraved mind, the mind of the old self, is something like this, in desperate need of an update, or better yet, a factory reset. When God does his work of renewal in our mind, it's like he's wiping the slate clean and restoring our operating system to factory settings. Now, instead of futile thinking that gives way to ignorance and corrupting sin, he's given us the foundation required in our minds to be transformed into an entirely new creation. And so he instructs us to look back at the beginning of verse 24. Put on the new self. Put on the new self. We've spent much time discussing the old self. Let's take a closer look now at this new self. It's described in verse 24 as something that has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth, in the likeness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. This new self that we put on is described as an entirely new creation. Remember that Romans 6 passage we read earlier that referred to the old self as crucified. Old things, as it were, have passed away, 
and new things have come. Oh, what power the church would have over sin if it truly embraced this reality. What joy we can share in each other's company and in the work of reconciliation that God has set before us. At that moment you came to believe in Christ, when you confessed with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believed in your heart God raised him from the dead, when you passed from non-regenerate to regenerate, outside of Christ to in Christ, remember the language he used there in that Corinthians passage, if anyone is in Christ, you became new. You got the factory reset that you desperately needed. You're like a brand new computer fresh out of the box with all the right updates and all of the right protections installed. You're equipped now to walk the worthy walk of a Christian, which manifests itself in love for God first and in our conduct toward one another here in the church and to the world around us, as Paul will detail in the rest of the book of Ephesians. We have all that we need to live this out now. We need only to heed the call. Lay aside the old, be renewed in the spirit of our mind, and put on the new. Look back at the middle of verse 24, where it says, which in the likeness of God, we would do well to never forget that we've been created in God's image and in his likeness. While sinful man through Adam did fall away from God, in sending his son, God has restored relations. He has reconciled us to himself, and he has recreated those who believe in the person and work of Jesus to that end, by sending his Holy Spirit to dwell within them and by renewing their minds. This new recreated self is the opposite of the old self, which was dominated by sin and doomed to corruption. God has reversed in believers the curse and set us free from the dominating power of sin. He has empowered us to increase then in Christ-likeness which is made clear here in the remainder of the verse. Let's look at the rest of 24. Which, has been, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. The new self is first of all created, not updated, not refurbished, but it is actually a new creation of God. It has been created with qualities that can only be described as qualities after the likeness of God, where it says in righteousness and holiness of the truth, God himself being the embodiment of righteousness, perfectly righteous, has through his Son imparted to us the ability to live in righteousness. Truth here is personified, holiness of truth, which stands in sharp contrast to the lusty deceit that we talked about earlier, which are the source of the old self's corruption, The holy truth of the new self, which finds its source and its sum in Jesus, works to purify and to sanctify those who don the new self. So in summary, this passage has called us to remember the true teaching which was imparted to us and by which we were saved. Teaching that is summed up perfectly in the life and the works of Jesus, the Messiah, who came to dwell among us, lived a perfect life, bore the shame, the punishment, and the death that we deserved on the cross and rose again victorious over sin, death, and Satan. In response to this glorious message, we've been commissioned both as individuals and as a corporate body of Christ to change our clothes, so to speak, to lay aside the old self and the corrupting influence of sin's domination and to be renewed in the spirit of our minds and put on the new self. This renewal is wrought by God as he works in us to completely change the way we think. Not just a psychological change, not just a change of our opinion, but a true and lasting change in the spirit of our mind and in our attitude that we might put on this new creation in the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness of the truth. If I could sum the purpose of this message up in a single sentence, it would go something like this. As Christians, we resolve to be more like Christ each day, laying aside the old self, which is subject to corruption, and putting on the new self, created in the likeness of God. You know, we talked a little about some of the most popular resolutions across the country at the beginning of the message, like weight loss, fitness, mental health, financial wellness. Those are all good resolutions, don't get me wrong, but I wonder if we as a church shouldn't aim a little higher. I'm an avid John Piper reader, If you've read John Piper any length of time, you know that he's heavily influenced by a man named Jonathan Edwards. 
Edwards was a man who lived in the 1700s in colonial United States. He's credited with sparking the Great Awakening. At the age of just 19, he set to paper a series of 70 resolutions for his life and committed to read them back to himself weekly. I won't read all 70 this morning, but I've selected a few to illustrate my point. Aim higher, FBC. Number 22, resolved to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the world to come as I possibly can. To accomplish this, I will use all the strength, power, vigor, vehemence, even violence I am capable of, or can bring myself to exert in any way that can be thought of. Here's number 28, resolved to study the scriptures so steadily and so constantly and so frequently that it becomes evident, even obvious to myself, that my knowledge of them has grown. And here's number 31, resolved never to say anything at all against anybody, except when to do so is perfectly consistent with the highest standards of Christian honor and love to mankind. And except when it is consistent with the sense of greatest humility and awareness of my own faults and failings. Then whenever I have said anything against anyone, I will examine my words against the strictest test of the golden rule. So aim higher, FBC. Those are wonderful. Some of the 70, probably impossible to maintain well on this side of glory, I'll be honest. But I would encourage you to read them over sometime. They're all available in public domain. If there's anyone in the hearing of this message, uh, hang on, I'm sorry, what about us here today, though, in the hearing of this message? I might suggest a handful of resolutions for us, both individually and as a church. So if there's anyone in the hearing of this message who's not repented of sin, and believed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, do not delay. Your salvation is sure in him. Believers, will you resolve this year to take the next step? If you've made the decision to take up your cross and follow him, will you not be baptized and join the local body and membership? Will you not then explore your spiritual gifting? And as a member of Christ's body, be, as Ephesians 4.16 would say, fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, which causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Will you join a discipleship group? January 1st is considered a reset date for all of our discipleship groups. It's a great time to get involved in one of those and engage in true discipleship. Will you join up with Adults on Mission team? and help in an effort to bring the nations right here to our doorstep through the ESL program that's starting this year. I was told they're having an informational meeting on the 14th of January, if you'd like to come and be a part of that. Will you go on a short-term mission trip this year and find out what it means to be a world Christian and not just an American Christian? Because trust me, there is a difference. Church, will you resolve to lay aside the old self and put on the new to speak truth to one another, to love one another, and regard one another as more important than ourselves. God is at work in us as individuals and as a body, and that means that if our efforts are aligned with his will, they will not fail. Father God, I pray that you would do that work in us. We know that you've empowered us by your Holy Spirit to lay aside our old selves and to put on our new selves. Lord, we hear your call this morning. I pray that you'd give us grace to hear the call, to be forever changed, to live out all of the commands of Scripture, to make the Scripture our greatest delight. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.